turned to Wolven Kwong, uh, who defended his PhD at Yale University in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and also has a bachelor from University of British Columbia in Biology and Physics. Walden very recently joined the IGC as a group leader um, and is interested in ecology, evolution, and function of microorganisms. How have they become so diverse and successful? What makes them form complex communities in between each other and the eukaryo eukaryotes? And how can we benefit from their tremendous evolutionary innovations? Please, Walden, the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nelson. Hello and welcome. Uh, I am Walden Kwong and I lead the Microbial Genomics and Symbiosis Lab at the Gobekin Institute of Science. Um, like Maria, I started the lab about um, three months ago, uh, so I don't have any new data to show you just yet. But for this talk, I want to share a couple of stories from my previous work that will help illustrate my interests and the way I do research, which I hope to carry forward into the new lab. Broadly speaking, I'm interested in microbial ecology and evolution through the lens of symbiotic systems. How do microbes interact with each other and with multicellular eukaryotes? How have they become so diverse? And what new biology can they teach us? To answer these questions, I find value in using what I call an inverted pyramid approach, starting broad, then drilling down to uncover novel insights we first leverage the power of high throughput methods and surveys to understand and characterize microbial communities. Then we can narrow this down by identifying particular microbes of interest, perhaps something phylogenetically novel or something abundant in certain conditions or simply something that we can culture. We can focus more sequencing their genomes and perform experimental manipulation to ultimately reveal new insights. So my first story is about the coral microbiome. Now, corals are well-known icons of symbiosis. There are thousands of coral species, many of which are photosynthetic through association with uh, symbiodiniaceae dinoflagellates. However, there are many other microorganisms that are also present in corals, including various algae, fungi, viruses, prokaryotes, and microeukaryotes. One of the main questions in coral microbiology research is to identify who the key members of the coral microbiome are amongst this giant messy microbial soup. In recent decades, focus has been heavily weighted towards characterizing the prokaryotic microbiome, um, mainly because it is uh, relatively simple, especially nowadays, to perform 16S amplicon sequencing. Instead, I decided to, to focus on examining the microeukaryotic community, which is a lot more poorly studied because one has to use non-conventional primers to exclude the animal host when amplifying 18S uh, to create a community profile of eukaryotes. Anyhow, we did this, and this is what we found. Each column here represents a single coral sample, which we collected in the Southern Caribbean. Different colors are different microbial eukaryotes that make up the communities in each sample. As expected, the most of the community consists of the primary endosymbionts, Symbiodiniaceae. However, we can also see that there is another organism present that can be quite prevalent here in black and which ended up being a lineage of Apicomplexa. In fact, it was the second most abundant member of the eukaryotic microbiome of corals after the Symbiodiniaceae. We next performed sampling across diverse coral clades spanning millions of years of diversification and found that up to 70% of genre possessed detectable levels of this apicomplexin. We then looked into our coral tissues and we found that this symbiont was residing within, intracellularly within the cells of the coral gastric cavity. We named this new lineage Coralicolids, meaning coral dweller. So finding this organism was pretty important because we could finally identify one of the long sought after members of the core coral microbiome. And then we dig deeper. As we know uh, that apicomplexins can have a very interesting evolutionary history. Um, you may be familiar with apicomplexins because they are commonly considered obligate parasites, including the causative agents of malaria and toxoplasmosis. 
but they actually involved from phototrophic ancestors. Their closest relatives are called chromarids, and they still retain a photosynthetic plastid. But somewhere along the way, this ability to photosynthesize was lost. How this transition between free living and parasitic lifestyles happened is a major question in the field. So how do chiralicolids fit into this? We sequence the genome of its plastid, uh, the plastids which are basically the remnants of chloroplasts in apicomplexins. This is a gene map of uh, vitrella, uh, a photosynthetic relative. And this is the chiralicolid. And this is uh, Toxoplasma gondii, which is an obligate parasite. In blue are ribosomal and other housekeeping genes. In yellow are photosystems, which are lost in chiralicolids and toxoplasma, but retained in the, uh, in the phototroph vitrella. But here in green are actually four ancestrally encoded genes for chlorophyll biosynthesis. Obviously, they were lost in toxoplasma, but surprisingly, they were retained in chiralicolids. This is the first instance we know of of these genes being present in what seems to be a non photosynthetic organism. So why are these genes being kept around. Now this is the big question as we uh, don't know of any biochemical function of these genes outside of chlorophyll production. However, we find that these genes are expressed and they are among the most evolutionarily conserved genes in the chiralicolid plastic genomes. Uh, shown here, having relatively few non-synonymous substitutions. And they retain all of the key residues thought to be important in uh, protein substrate uh, binding. So now we're currently working with a group at Nagoya University who are experts in chlorophyll biochemistry to try and determine uh, gene function. Um, and they have some very interesting results, which I can't give away right here just yet, but it suggests that in chiralicolids and potentially other species, these well-characterized photosynthetic pathways may be performing a previously unrecognized or novel function, which is really exciting. Okay, let's move on to talk about my other system, that of bees. In contrast to corals, honeybees have a very well-defined microbiome consisting of uh, five core bacterial lineages and a few other sporadically occurring ones. We know this because since about 2010, culture-independent surveys have consistently found the same bacteria present in bee samples around the world. Just to illustrate the system better, here's a picture of the bee and the hindgut region uh, where most of the bacteria are located. And the bacteria are absolutely packed in there with up to 1 billion cells per individual worker bee. And they're not all just randomly jumbled in as well. There are distinct localizations uh, for different species of the gut microbiome. Using our knowledge from our survey results, we were able to target our cultivation efforts and bring the entirety of the microbial community into culture in a lowered oxygen environment. Members of the microbiome include gram-positive species, such as Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium, uh, as well as several gram-negative members, such as Giliomella and Snodgrassella, which were novel species that we described. Now, we also did a lot of work on what exactly the bacteria were doing in the gut and what the benefits to the host are, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, what I do want to discuss is the question of how a, an organism survives in its environment. In the case of Snodgrassella, we wanted to know which genes enable it to thrive in the bee gut. The first thing I did was to assemble the genome and identify the metabolic pathways encoded within. We know from cultivation that Snodgrassella is a microaerophile it requires some oxygen to grow. So looking at its genome, we see um, cytochrome oxidase, NADH dehydrogenase, all good. Um, there's also a TCA cycle. Uh, but when we looked at it, it was one of those, hmm, there's something weird going on here moments because it was actually missing succinyl-CoA synthetase. In the standard TCA cycle, this enzyme is encoded by two proteins, uh, SUC-C and SUC-D, which form a heterodimer. 
to that together, this converts succinyl CoA uh, into succinates. And these genes are necessary to complete the TCA cycle. Uh, strains with knockouts of these genes will not be able to grow normally, um, instead having to rely on glycolysis and fermentation. So the lack of this key enzyme is highly suspicious in an aerobic organism and strongly hinted at the existence of an unusual metabolism. Around this time, we were also conducting transposon insertion sequencing of Snodgrass cella to determine the genes involved in gut colonization. We ended up identifying a candidate gene, a putative acetate succinate CoA transferase, um, or ASCT, that was necessary for living in the B gut. In fact, mutants in this gene had a 30 fold reduction in fitness in vivo. So, this gene could potentially replace SUC CD by transferring CoA to acetate instead of producing ATP. We did a literature search and found that homologs of this gene had previously been found in bacteria used in vinegar production, where it was also suggested to play a role in the TCA cycle. So this indicated that this unusual TCA cycle may actually be widespread. And we did a bioinformatics search of all bacterial genomes at the time and found that 20% had hits to this gene. These represent species from at least three different phyla including several prominent human commensals, such as Kingella and Neisseria, as well as opportunistic pathogens, Moraxella, Coronabacterium, and Acinetobacter. So these genes were in Snodgrass cella and in these other bacteria. Were they fulfilling that missing step in the TCA cycle? To test this, I cloned the ASCT genes from representative strains into an E. coli background and tested if they could rescue TCA cycle function in the absence of succinyl CoA synthetase. And here are the results. You see the wild type is in black and uh, the controls, these are negative controls. And these are the heterologously expressed ASCT genes. So you can clearly see that all of them are able to successfully rescue uh, TCA cycle function. So what's the benefit here? Why do these different bacteria have this unusual modified TCA cycle when there's already a perfectly competent canonical enzyme, succinyl CoA transferase? Um, we suspect that the answer may lie in the substrate acetate. Um, this modified TCA cycle is found in bacteria involved in vinegar, which is acetic acid production, and in animal symbionts. And acetate is actually a common metabolic byproduct in many gut microbial communities. So this suggests that there is an advantage of using uh, ASCT instead of the canonical TCA cycle in these environments, at least for some bacteria. Another curious aspect that we found when looking through all of these genomes was evidence of repeated evolutionary transitions between succinyl CoA synthetase and ASCT dependent TCA function. For instance, in the Neisseriaceae, which is a group of obligately aerobic uh, beta proteobacteria, uh, we find repeated uh, losses and gains of one enzyme or another over the course of its, their evolution. At a broader level, we actually find that many bacterial species carry both um, succinyl CoA synthetase and ASCT uh, here in blue. So, how is the TCA cycle regulated in these microbes? Do both pathways work together or do they have, are, they, are they alternating? Are they switching on and off, uh, taking turns? And we have no idea. It's, uh, it's, it's something probably worth following up on uh, given how prevalent these enzymes appear to be. Um, but uh, right now we don't have the data on that. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now by uh, returning to the central thesis of my talk, uh, that the study of non-traditional or even obscure organisms can have great value and potential. It can lead us to see old concepts in a new light, as in the case of chlorophyll biosynthesis and the TCA cycle in coral and bee symbionts, respectively. And nowadays, it is easier than ever to explore the biology of non-traditional models. Not only can we do affordable deep sequencing on environmental and mixed samples, but we also are getting better at growing things in the lab. And we also have an abundant array of tools 
uh, for genetic manipulation. So I think uh, exploring diverse systems will only gain in feasibility and importance uh, in the coming years ahead. So I seem to be ahead of schedule, but um, I would like to acknowledge the uh, uh, all the people and the funding that made the work possible. And this work was done in the labs of Patrick Keeling and Nancy Moran, uh, two very supportive uh, advisors and mentors. And I too would like to advertise the positions available in my new lab. So if any of this type of work here sounds interesting to you, uh, there is a postdoc opening for recent graduates. Feel free to reach out and contact me uh, for details by email, social media, and so on. Um, thanks a lot. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you very much, Walden. Very, very nice talk. I'm a little bit biased because I like very much bees. So, so Maria, go on. Hi, Walton, amazing talk. Um, I was wondering, so the bee gut microbiome, microbiome is mainly aerobic, right? Um, well, there, there is one species that is, um, it's that strictly, it needs, it needs oxygen, but a lot of species are actually uh, facultative. Um, so, yeah, and, uh, yes. yeah I, I'm, I'm asking because like the, the TCA cycle is also something that I'm, I'm very interested in. And it's, it's amazing that, um, you know, the story about uh, um, this um, acetate dependent enzyme, because um, mm -hmm. at least um, I, I looked at the bacteroiditis before, uh, and mm -hmm. they seem to run the TCA cycle, like the two branches, right, um, right. reductive and um, oxidative, like not as a cycle, but as a branches. And yeah. um, you had them as well, right, in your tree, that they also yes. have this enzyme. Yes, yes, um, yes. yes. I, I did look into uh, the, the homologue and bacteroidetes. Yeah. It, it so, so I'm wondering if you way. know if yeah. this enzyme can actually catalyze the reaction in both directions or it goes only from um, succinate to succinyl CoA and not the other no, way. No, no, it, it can go in both directions. Yes, yes. Okay. Should probably look more into that enzyme. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, Camille. Hi, um, I have a question about the chlorophylla in the microbiota of the uh, corals. Mm -hmm. um, so some, uh, so so they they use uh, algae to to do the photosynthesis, right? The the corals. Mm -hmm. yes. Could it be also the same that this function is is present in some bacteria because some some snails do photosynthesis for example could that be the case and mm -hmm. if if not do you have a, an hypothesis about um, the function of the chlorophylla in these bacteria? yeah yeah so that that's that's the big question that we don't know so in in our apicomplexin um this um in this symbionts they don't have photosystems right so it it it's not doing photosynthesis and they're actually they're not green if you look at so actually uh, let's see here's a, here's actually a video of oops is this gonna play oh no i can't get it to play okay well oh here we go here we go so this is actually a video of the organ of, of, our, of our organism and you can see it's not good green here's here are uh the symbiogeneaceae cells which which are the the primary uh endosymbiont and it's a photosynthesizer. But this one, it has the genes for chlorophyll biosynthesis, but it ha doesn't have um, the genes for uh, the photosystems. So it's, it's probably not photosynthetic. And they, again, we don't know exactly what, what its function is. Yeah. Okay, Karina. Um, hi, well then. Uh, in, um, about your E. coli experiment where you, um, Added the, you wanted to test the complementation of the acetate succinate co-transferase. Um, so did you did you also add acetate or it's just the acetate produced by the by E. coli would be? I, I don't. I was wondering like we what was the basically the carbon source in the and about the gross conditions that you were using for E. coli and basically the reason I am asking was if you could use this experiment to try to understand in terms of um, 
energy if there was a loss uh, uh, to have this enzyme instead of, of the usual uh, succinyl CoA synthase? Because yeah. you an ATP, right? Or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of room for, for doing uh, more in vitro experiments to, to work out the energetics. And uh, we, we did use acetate, so uh, uh, exogenous acetate um, uh, in, in the medium. And that's how we did, did, the, did the growth curves. Yeah. So maybe there's, there's only an advantage of using, like if you had, two, if you had the, the two pathways, for example, would mm -hmm. there be maybe only advantage to use this, this uh, route if you have mm -hmm. a cell fast state? Yes, yeah, it, it could be. And if somebody did uh, say uh, maybe some transcriptomic work on bacteria that have both enzymes and see how maybe they could you know, see you know, regulation of it in, in different uh, growth conditions. And then that's, that's a possibility, yeah. But you didn't see any growth defect of having um, an E. coli uh, with, when you complemented this uh, no, no, they, they, they grew at the same as wild type, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay, is there any other question for Walden? Because we still have 10 minutes. No questions? I, I have a very naive question, Walden. It's regarding to the bee system. So you keep the, the bees, the bee colonies outside, right? In nature. Yes. So, yes. so how are you going to deal with these uh, pests that affect these colonies? I mean, in Portugal, mm -hmm. most of the bee colonies go down. I mean, I know this yes. because my, my father yes. is a beekeeper, my grandfather yeah. is a beekeeper. How are you going yeah. to do this? It's very, it's very simple, but I, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, 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 uh, it will be a challenge. Uh, I, I have not raised bees in Portugal before, and especially here, you have the uh, the, the Asian wasp, uh, which is, uh, it's, it's becoming a big problem. Um, so um, we are working with uh, the, um, the, the local out the agricultural INAV, uh, the agricultural research station, and the um, some of the beekeeping associations here, and we'll try to uh, depend on their experience to, yeah. to to work out the best ways to to protect our hives. Yes, I, I I'm, I'm asking this because I think this could be an opportunity. I don't know. This you mm -hmm. could you could check if certain kinds of microbiota could give more resistance to any of these. Uh, Pests. I'm I'm not talk, talking only about the Asian uh, mm -hmm. bee, or I'm talking about, for example, varroa, the, the the mite that affects them, and so on and so forth. But anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, actually, one of the experiments that we have planned is, is to look at the uh, 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 the bee transcriptomic responses to the presence of, of different uh, uh, pathogens and and, and, and the, uh, chemicals and, and, and insults, basically, and environmental, and what the potential benefit or protective role of the microbiota could be in that. So I guess that's something that's, that we would be looking forward to, to testing in the future. That's awesome. Yeah. So any other questions? Okay. Walden, thank you very much.